Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight's uh, IPO briefing. We have here GTS Group Berhad, uh, the Image Director, Mr. Lee Kok Chun, Sheldon, we, the Executive Director, and we have Samila, the CFO. This is one quite interesting IPO that uh, we will be doing, uh, hosting. As we all know, I think um, they'll be en route to the ACE market listing. Uh, 11 January is their closing, 26 is their IPO listing day. And this is one of the few IPOs that there is no offer for sale per se, basically, which means the manage the promoters are not selling any any shares. Basically, uh, the fundraise is accruing to the company for business expansion, and they are in very unique position. Basically, as you can see, they are key. Uh, cooling energy segment is one of the very important, as we all know about the energy consumption that is going up, uh, helping the company save money per se. And also some of the hot data centers that's coming up, which they are also in the talks. So without much further ado, I will pass it to them to let you run through the corporate video to have a better understanding and for them to run through the presentation. Thank you. Welcome to KJTS Group, where we provide building support services with innovation and sustainability. Since our foundation in 1984, we have an established track record for the provision of cooling energy, cleaning, and facilities management services, serving across markets in Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. At the heart of our services is our holistic approach to cooling energy management. Our in-house engineers provide end-to-end -end services, supporting the complete life cycle of cooling energy systems. Through value engineering, we not only lower the capital costs of cooling energy systems, but also enhance energy efficiency, reducing operating costs. In our EPCC projects, we meticulously carry out or oversee installation works, ensuring excellence and timely delivery on all of our projects. Our stringent management and supervision of these projects highlights our dedication to quality and reliability. We also provide comprehensive facilities management services, utilizing technical expertise and technology to offer transparent and cost-effective solutions, including static and mobile facilities management. From conducting detailed energy audits to ongoing operations and maintenance, we aim to ensure optimal efficiency at every stage of our cooling energy management services. Our central command center exemplifies our commitment to advanced technology, enabling remote system monitoring and control and big data analytics reporting. Our mobile facilities management team is on the move 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our preventive and major maintenance measures are designed to prevent breakdowns and especially serving clients with assets in multiple locations. This forward-thinking approach reflects our commitment to exceeding industry standards and supporting our clients' long-term visions. KJTS Group's cleaning services span across a wide range of properties, from commercial spaces to theme parks and high-density residential areas. Our specialized cleaning for clean rooms in manufacturing facilities sets us apart, showcasing our versatility and skill. Aligned with ESG principles, our projects have significantly cut electricity consumption, saving approximately 52,441 megawatt hours and reducing CO2 emissions by approximately 32,619 tons between January 2017 and November 2023. KJTS Group holds four ISO certifications, My Hijau Mark, and CIDB certificates. We are also registered as an energy service company, ESCO, by the Energy Commission Malaysia. With a growing regional footprint, from Malaysia to Singapore and Thailand, grounded in local expertise, our commitment to excellence has earned us trust and accolades across borders. As we continue to expand and innovate, KJTS Group remains dedicated to providing high-quality, sustainable solutions in the building support services industry. KJTS Group, building support services provider. All right, over to you, Casey, for the offering. 
Um, uh, John William, uh, William, can you put on the slide, please? Okay. Well, we think, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for joining the webinar. My name is uh, Casey Lee. So I'm the Managing Director of KJTS Group. Thank you for spending the evening and to join the webinar again. So I'll go straight to the offering structure uh, to talk to you about structure. William, can you go to the page? So uh, uh, company KJTS is an IPO in the ACE market. And uh, one thing to highlight about our company uh, is Shira compliance. Uh, there's total share of 688 million shares uh, at the 27 cents. So the price range, minimum price is 25 to 27. So anyway, Vincent has mentioned, this is a 100% primary offering, means we are uh, me, Sheldon, and uh, we are not uh, selling any of our shares. Basically, all the proceeds are going to the company for expansion and growth. So uh, me and Sheldon, and also a pre ipo investor will subject to moratorium. For myself and Sheldon, it's up to three years. Uh, it's staggered whereas the pre-IPO investors uh, have a moratorium of six months. So as you can see, uh, the utilization of proceeds, uh, majority, uh, uh, which is about 70% of the proceeds are at our uh, expansion of cooling energy segment. So we also intend to distribute at least 20% uh, for dividend, for consolidated PAT for each financial year. So key highlights is uh, the prospectus has launched on the 5th last Friday. And the uh, closing of retail offering is 11 January, 5 p.m. Price determination will be on 11 January and balloting date is on 11 January. So the listing date is actually on 26 January. Next slide. This is the group structure. Uh, on the left, this is uh, the shareholders, including the pre-IPO investor. On the right is actually the all the subsidiaries and all the uh, associate related to KJTS Group. I'll pass uh, uh, the floor to Sheldon to present on the company. Thanks, Casey. Sheldon, I'm the Executive Director of uh, KJTS Group. So, about KJTS, our principal activities are in building support services in three segments, with cooling energy being the highest, 46.3%, and we have two ancillary services, which is the facilities management and the cleaning services. The types of revenue stream that we have in our business is 84.8% recurring income, uh, revenue. The building types or the sector that we provide the services currently are in the commercial and mixed uh, development, which is 69.5%. Commercial and mixed basically comprise of shopping malls, commercial buildings, uh, retail um, and hospitals and so on. Industrial, which consists of 23.3% revenue, which basically consists of semi-cons, manufacturing, manufacturing and industrial uh, areas. Institution at 7.2% is basically universities and schools. Our principal markets, we are operating in three countries. Our major uh, or our HQ, which is in Malaysia, carries the bulk of the revenue of 75.2%. Uh, we have operations in Thailand, which carries 4.8% of revenue, which we have a joint venture uh, that we started in 2020. And we have an operations in Singapore, which carries revenue of 20%, which started in end 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Now, just to give you a brief, brief snapshot of what we do on a cooling energy segment, we basically build uh, medium-sized to large, to very large air conditioning systems in layman terms. Uh, which basically provide air conditioning for standalone buildings right up to large developments and also right up to uh, a real district district system where, where it's defined as a district cooling system. So if you look at the two types of centralized cooling systems that we have, one, we supply district cooling systems where we supply to several buildings within development. And Chiller Plant basically only provides air conditioning to one standalone building. If you look at the schematic on the right side, our medium of how we cool buildings are basically using chill water. Predominantly in housing, in housing areas, air conditioning is cooled by refrigerant via a copper piping. And then 
they goes to a blower and the blower blows cold air out and then the the, the balance of it comes with the heat comes up from the compressors the systems uh, that we do is more or less the same it's a loop system but what we do is that we use a medium which is chill water the chillers chill the water sends it through a piping through the blowers or the, or the air, air side of the building which is the air handling units and FC use and they will blow out uh, coal air and then the chill water is then will be will be transported back with a lower temperature with, with a higher temperature back to the chiller system to be chilled again so it's one loop system of which we use chill water yeah. next slide please in our cooling energy segment revenue streams we have two segments uh, that we we provide services to Segment A is the EPCC portion, which is basically the design and the construction portion. Segment B is our full-fledged cooling energy management services. I would like to draw your attention to segment B first. This is basically our key offering that we provide in KJTS. Our main core of our cooling energy is derived from this, in which we provide the, the entire full uh, proposition to our client. What we do is that both these segments cater to brown fields and to green fields. If you look at the energy audit, they are predominantly for brown fields. For green fields, we usually provide uh, initial concept and a, and a theoretical calculation. So I'll talk about segment B first. What we do is that as an in-house uh, company, we provide energy audits to our clients. We provide a design and an efficiency uh, design. We build the design. We, build the cons we do a construction that actually delivers that exact design. And then we operate and maintain and guarantee an efficiency that depict the design. And throughout the whole tenure, the tenure of the building, could, the, the project could be 10 or 15 years, to, right up to 25 years. This is a full, uh, full program that we provide to our clients. In the top portion, you see the general process flow, which is only the EPCC portion. There are occasions where the clients uh, would prefer to break up the process in which they would like to do the construction first before they actually look into the possibilities of us running the operations and maintenance. So as a company, we do not generally look at construction projects by itself. We will only look at opportunities where there is a guaranteed or at least some scope for us to then further do the operation and maintenance and guarantee a certain kind of efficiency of the plant. So only with that in mind, we will then perhaps consider doing the EPCC portion and then after that work up to upsell the operation and maintenance program. Next slide, please. This is the revenue streams breakdown that you will see throughout uh, the last three years. As you can see, in Thailand, is a good example of where we are standing today. When we talk about recurring incomes down here, people always ask us, uh, do we just do the construction and then how, how does, what happens after that? Now, in a typical construction situation, you build a plan, you have the spike of the, of, of the turnover, and after that, when the job is done, after installation and commissioning, the revenue goes back to zero. So Thailand is a good depiction of, what, of, of it because we have one project down there, which we've just completed the EPCC, and one, upon completing the EPCC, it relates to a recurring income for the next 15 years. So on top of that, if we were to get project B, project C, project D, for more projects, EPCC comes in and then the recurring keeps piling up uh, on project on project. Yeah. Next slide. This is on the two ancillary services that we have, which is the facilities management and cleaning services. On the facilities management, we have broken it down to two segments. One is static FM and mobile FM. Static FM traditionally is all the FM services that we see today uh, run by many businesses out there where why we call it static because traditionally we station workers at one site in one building to manage all the services. To differentiate ourselves from the market, we decided to go into mobile FM. Mobile FM is basically a business in which we actually deploy almost 100 over workers and technical workers throughout Malaysia where they provide facilities management to sm small to medium-sized uh, um, buildings. An example of one of our clients, Nando's, they have about two to three hundred outlets throughout Malaysia. There's, it's not possible for us to actually supply standby workers for each outlet throughout the country. So in this respect, we provide mobile FM via our help desk uh, systems in which our mobile people will 
go to all the outlets throughout Malaysia and provide them preventive maintenance services to service all the air conditioning systems, all the assets within the outlets. From there, we will charge them. A, this will be a fixed fee that we will charge on a monthly basis. Then comes the reactive portion in which if there is any form of call-outs or emergency throughout any outlet throughout the country where to the extent of to like changing light bulbs, uh, servicing air conditioning systems, uh, fixing the kitchen hob, so on and so forth, they just go to our help desk system, call in and within an hour or so, our people that turn up, repair those things and then charge out on a rate card of which we will then invoice at the end of the month. That's our reactive portion. We also have a third portion on that because we are managing all the assets of our clients, we QR code all our assets, all the clients' assets, and we manage them, and we have a database of all their assets and how they, how efficient are they. So if any situation where Nando's, for instance, want to open a new outlet, they look at the possibility through our database, and we provide a proposal where we actually can do the fit-out for them because we have the database of all the equipment that runs well, and we can actually provide a proposal to show them which are the best equipments to fit out for their new outlets. So we also, um, in many cases, win their fit-out program. So that's the third program that we get, uh, FM facilities management. On the fourth part, because we have mobile FM today, we've decided to look at the potential of how we can manage static FM by reducing costs on the, on the program that we have there. We have taken instances where at a static FM, where at any one time you may require a certain amount of workers on a peak time that you require a full manning. But there are times when it's not at a peak manning may be, may be less required, but nevertheless, you're paying fees and salaries for a full team. What we've done here is that we've basically looked at the potential of cutting down manpower to a certain amount or to a minimum, and where we've cut down, that percentage is then covered by the mobile FM. We've noted through this program, not only have we become more efficient, we've also managed to save the client a certain percentage of the fees. And this is what we have achieved recently and won a couple of projects. We look at this as some sort of a disruptor, disruptor in the market for the static FM field, which provide, provides us a great competitive advantage. For the cleaning services, we do general cleaning services, but we also specialize in specific kind of uh, very specialized cleaning, like high-rise external facade cleaning, where our workers are trained to do app sailing, and they are all IRATA certified and certified by DOSH for safety and health. The margins are much higher in this sector as compared to just general cleaning services. We also do specialized GMP and clean room cleaning services for our semiconductors and our uh, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing plants. Next slide, please. So just to go through some key investment highlights. Next slide. ESG. So what we do basically contributes to sustainability reporting for our clients and also for the ESG uh, uh, world that we live in today. As of January 2017, we have approximately saved 52,441 megawatt hours of electricity and avoided approximately 32,619 tons of CO2 emissions. Just to give uh, emissions, sorry, just to give you some idea, this equates to a certain amount of trees they were saved, which has, is equal to almost the size of the Jaya. Now, bear in mind, we've only started clocking these savings from 2017. Bear in mind, our company has been operating for almost 39 years and as an energy company from 1995, if you actually clocked in the amount of savings we've done from 1995, we have actually, our numbers in this segment will be quadruple the amount or more. So for our clients, this is a very important thing because we are somewhat seen as an ESG enabler. With the situation today where the governments are looking at putting compulsory uh audits, which is not mandated, but they are looking at the, the potential of uh, putting this kind of rules out and for the need of cutting electricity because electricity bills are going up, this plays a major role uh, in the outlook of where we are going. Next slide, please. A little bit of background about our company. We've been in operation for 39 years. We were part and owned by a very large French conglomerate um, who was specialized in energy management in the past. In 2015, the French company left Malaysia, in fact, broke up globally and sold all its assets in, in globally. Casey, myself, and the entire team, as you can see, are all people who were working, were basically working and built by the French company. Uh, most, of, most of our staff are 15 years and above operating in the company. My business partner, Casey, was, his last position in the business was a COO. 
So we decided to join forces and actually did an MBO in 2015 and made this company a Malaysian built company. If you look at our accreditations, we are not short of any certifications. We have the full-fledged ISO certifications. We are also registered with CIDB grade, grade 7, it's the highest grade. I'd like to bring your attention for two certifications here, which is Malaysian My Hijau. Now, Malaysian My Hijau, we are registered with their directory. So any client that uses our services basically has the, uh, they can write on our, on our certification to apply for special subsidies or government incentives on loans and rebates and so on and so forth. Secondly, we are also a, a qualified and uh, we have a qualified and accredited ESCO company by the Surahan Jaya Commissions on Energy. And this is something that I was talking earlier that we are now uh, authorized and uh, to sign off audits on energy management. Yeah. Next slide. This is the key team, as I was mentioning earlier. As you can see, all of us have been in the company for quite some time, uh, more than 15 years and above. Yeah. Next slide. So now, bring attention to this slide. If you look, this is a typical program that we put, uh, that we do everything in-house. If you look at it closely, in the pre in historically, how it's done or traditionally how it's done, when a developer or anybody wants to build a building or a development, they will hire a consultant. A consultant will then look at, if it's a brownfield, they'll do an energy audit. If it's a greenfield, they will do a theoretical calculation and come up with a design, initial conceptualization. And then they'll come up with engineering and design and they'll submit it to the client. The client will then take this, get it approved, and then call out for tender for the construction. After the construction is done, the contractor will then install, it, uh, install and commission the program and then hand it over to the asset owner and after his DLP is over. And then the asset owner will either choose to do the operation and maintenance of the plan in-house or outsource. Now, I wouldn't say the problem with this, but I would say the potential issues with this is that having three different parties or even two parties doing this is the accountability and the guarantee of the efficiency. So in a situation where what has been design what has been constructed and when the operators actually run it if it doesn't tell you to what it's supposed to deliver where does the blame sit who takes the accountability who takes the responsibility of the 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 non-conformance or the non uh non-performance of the plan basically is the asset owner so where we come in and what we where we come in to solve the owner's problem is that we do everything in-house from the from energy audits to initial conceptualization engineering and design we construct it in-house we then operate and maintain and we guarantee the client a fixed energy bill and a fixed, uh, sorry, a fixed efficiency, a fixed chill water rate. And we also do comprehensive uh, operation and maintenance where we guarantee the, the lifespan of the equipment. So there is no blame game in this. We take the whole accountability of this program. And going further, if the client needs us to also raise CAPEX or to take up the CAPEX for this, we are in a position to actually put the CAPEX in and put money where our mouth is to program to do this program. Next slide. This is our command center. Our command center is a 24-7 monitoring uh, system that we have uh, people uh, managing from the office. On top of the site that we have, we have staff at sites. We also have this secondary watch of where we can monitor all our plans and all their critical indicators uh, of the entire plan. Now, bear in mind, all our engineers that built this plan, designed the plan, sits upstairs of this command center. In the event there's any alarms, or any alerts, or any troubleshooting, our team members can actually come down and help the site team to manage the situation. This provides an extra layer of monitoring and management of our, of our chiller plants. On top of this, we also collect a lot of data and analytics for the plants, of which then from different scenarios we will collect and we create algorithms of how to manage the plant and make it more efficient. Next. The three segments, synergistic services, this is an important thing for us. The reason why we have these three segments and, and how we, we leverage and this is cross-selling within segments. Um, the current denominator among these three segments is the clientele. So if you look at the, what we have here, there are, there are instances where, where we do cooling energy, we downsell to cleaning services. And we have some sites we have cleaning services, we upsell to facilities management, cooling energy, and vice versa. So this is a very important tool that we have for organic growth within our company. 
we have a specific BD team and an incubating, incubator team that actually looks at this and, and continuously churn out proposals for all our clients for all the three segments in our business. Next slide. These are just an indicator to show you that our strong growth in recurring income and that we do not focus on construction alone, then our main core business are all recurring income and all under the banner of our, our full uh, build, operate, and transfer programs that we have. Next slide. Okay, I'll pass this to my CFO, Shamila. Right. Thanks, Sheldon. Okay, I will proceed to, uh, to present on our group financials. So this slide shows our financial snapshot for revenue, gross profit, profit after tax and related margins for last three years, full financial year 2020, 2021, 2022, and also financial period ending seven months, July 2022 and July 2023. So the bar charts here actually showing all our revenue and the, uh, and the lines are showing the related margins. So overall, our revenue is increasing and our GP margin increase, except for seven months, 2023, there's a drop from 24.4% 24 to 21.6% compared to uh, seven months, 2022. So the reason I can explain in the next slide. Um, so on the right is the revenue uh, breakdown by geographical market. So we are operating in three countries, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. So for all these years and also the financial period ending, uh, Malaysia is still our primary market and contributing more than 70% uh, revenue to our group revenue. All right, next slide, please. All right, this slide shows our revenue and GP margin breakdown by business activities. So we have four business activities, cooling energy management services, EPCC, facilities management and cleaning services. Uh, same, the bar chart is showing our revenue and the line is uh, GP margin. So uh, overall, uh, okay, I'll go by segment by segment, uh, activity by activity. So on this first one, CEMS, the revenue uh, uh, dropped for seven months, 2023, and the GP also dropped. So this, the reason here, major reason is because in the first, uh, the seven months, 2022, we have a portion for EPCC. Uh, in one of our contract in Bangkok. There's only one contract in Bangkok. So th this contract, we started with a retrofit or, or we call it EPCC. So that portion, uh, revenue for that portion is included in the first seven months, 2022. Whereas in seven months, 2023, there's no more uh, EPCC revenue. It's only on the uh, um, on the chill water supplies with the recurrent revenue. So that that is the drop uh, from the 17.2 to 14.1. Uh, and that also uh, um, gives the GP margin drop from 39 to 30. So that was the major reason for the drop. For the EPCC, um, the revenue and the GP is going up. So facilities management, uh, there's a drop in slight drop in the revenue and the GP. So uh, the reason is because there's a change in the scope and also the GP drop uh, also due to our increase in our manpower, especially for mobile FM, where we actually uh, ramp up our technicians uh, to to cater more uh, uh, we, to cater more clients nationwide. So on the cleaning services, despite the revenue increase for the seven months 2023, there is a slight drop, uh, not slight, uh, it's a drop in the uh, uh, GP margin. That's because of um, we use our own foreign workers. Um, then uh, we need to provide the uh, accommodation, the mobilization costs, the training to, to, uh, to train them to take over from our existing subcontractors. So there is a period where there will be an overlapping of costs because um, when uh, subcontractors leave the um, uh, uh, leave the plan uh, leave the place, so they have to hand over or train the next person, which is our own workers. So there was an overlapping cost for maybe about two to three weeks. So that uh, actually impacted the seven months, twenty twenty three. Right. So the next slide. Um, is on our, our key financial ratios. Ratios. Um, these are the ratios for uh, financial year end December 2022 and uh, financial period ending 31st July 2023. Okay, then uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this section four is uh, more to um, our utilization of funds. So um, 
about 69% of our um, uh, funds will be used for expansion of cooling energy segment in Malaysia. So we will be focusing on the EPCC of cooling energy system as part of our CMS and also expanding our EPCC as a standalone stand basis uh, projects as well. So the next uh, one will be uh, expansion on our office in Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore. Next slide, please. Okay. So we will be expanding our offices. Uh, Malaysia is our HQ, so we will be expanding our um, office in the Malaysia, Thailand and also Singapore. Next slide, please. The third one uh, will be our, our points will be utilized for working capital and also uh, the remaining for the listing expenses. Right. That's all for the presentation. All right, thanks, uh, Casey and Sheldon and Shamila for the presentation. Okay. Uh, let's run through some of the questions that we have here. You share this what is the uh, KGTS market share of your CMS, I mean, your cooling energy management services, your facility management services, and your cleaning services. The market share actually is the market is very big. Currently, we uh only have less than one percent of the total market share in Malaysia. So basically, there's a huge room more to uh for us to expand. Um, how 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 does uh KGTS uh compare to the other facility management services or some of the so called related cooling energy services that is listed on the ACE market? Uh. I think uh, Sheldon has uh, already highlighted uh, what differentiates us from other facility management company, mainly which is the mobile FM. And if you look at the contribution, the mobile FM is actually uh, the main bigger contribution, majority more than uh, award. Despite our mobile FM is only started around three years ago, it has been growing uh, quite fast, rapidly. I think we were, uh, Sheldon also mentioned we've got more than 100 staff throughout Malaysia deployed already. So that, that we actually went through the pain process to actually establish our footprint and throughout entire Malaysia, including Sabah, Sarawak. So for us to sign up new customer, we are actually in a very good position to uh, provide services to similar customer without needing to go through the entire process. So the barrier entry is not as uh, is not that easy because to, to establish that network is not so simple. And all these stuff are actually all in-house. They are, we are not outsourcing to any uh, to any suppliers. Okay, interesting. Could you share with us the some of the major clients that I mean some of them maybe you can you couldn't disclose uh, the names uh, which are the ones that you could disclose I think you mentioned about Nando just now Sheldon was mentioning about Nando so um for for them so that they can get a bit more familiar for mobile FM I think there's a group called Alpha Time Group so people like Zara they own a few brands so these these are the retail group they are also custom so uh custom is also one of our customer uh baked with yen so they are all many clients with many outlets. So uh, I think Shadow also mentioned about a hybrid. So there's this particular uh, client we have. Uh, I'm not sure I can disclose, but anyway, they got they are something of an international warehousing. So they actually we beat the uh, it's like a static FM, but what we do is we actually provide a hybrid where we give enough manpower uh, at site full time to make sure that they are all fully utilized. So whenever there's a need, we just deploy our mobile FM and to uh, add in the additional stuff that's required. So the the is. Talk about efficiency. So you don't have people idling because normally if a typical site, if you have uh, 10 people, the peak you need 10 people, but there are more, more, a lot of instances that you don't need all 10 at the same time. So that's where we come in. So you do not, uh, so your major clients are all the so-called the, uh, none, none of them from the government government sector, right? Not, not, not all major. I said is mainly on the uh, mobile FM. So you talk mm -hmm. about cooling and new segment. So uh, we got major uh, customer like Micron is a semiconductor. People like Unisam and also uh, Molinka. They are all uh, multi semiconductor plants. Uh, and you talk about uh, major shopping mall uh, like Perilion Damasara, which is recently opened, is our customer. Then uh, all the malls like uh, MCOP more, Summit more. So we actually uh, help them to uh, reduce energy by upgrading and retrofitting their existing general plant. And we actually serve a uh, long-term contract. Contract like MCOP more, we actually started with just 10 years. 
So after the before the tenure expires, we find more opportunity to use the energy and they are happy with us, they actually renew another 15 years to guarantee the savings. So they further reduce the energy uh, consumption by the second phase also. Interesting, a lot of uh, interesting and uh, big names that you have as a clients. Yeah, so you uh, question about government. So uh, we don't, I don't uh, recall a government directly, but we go through a lot of GLC. So Petronas is also one of uh, our clients because we built uh, the Petronas plant in KLCC. Then uh, KLCC and also UNIC Technology Petronas, we did a retrofitting and improved their cost of production by putting a thermal energy storage. So thermal energy storage is basically shifting the load from day to night, where at night time they actually enjoy half price in elasticity. So during the night, we actually store cooling energy. So when the daytime and the elasticity price is doubled, we just discharge the cooling and minimize the usage during the day. So from that, there's also a significant savings that can be achieved. Hey, we have some questions here from Mr. Lee here asking about uh, why CMS dropped the year on year, uh, for the seven months and also they're asking about how many sites are contributing to the CMS segment. I think Shamila has answered that. Maybe Shamila can repeat uh, for Mr. Lee's purpose. Yep. Uh, this for July 2022 versus 2023. Okay, the drop because of the one of the contract in Bangkok. We started with the uh, EPCC, so the revenue for EPCC was captured in uh, uh, 2022. Whereas uh, after the EPCC is complete, then we just continue with our recurring revenue, uh, which is uh, is ongoing. The, the contract is for 15 years, so we are capturing the, only the recurring revenue for uh, Bangkok now. So that's why there's a drop in uh, 2022 versus 2023. So 2023 is only on the recurring part. Hey. Perhaps could you share with us about your recurring income as well, the segment? Some of your recurring, uh, recurring, uh, how how significant and how Something sticky. Something to mention, I think a highlight is 85% of our uh, project are recurring. So one of the major contribution, because why is recurring when we do a CMS contract? So we already know from uh, day one, whether we know from day one or we win it after we complete the construction. So we have always minimum, you need to have two contract which is only five years, many are 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. So every time we complete a project, we do not fall back to zero like any typical construction company. We will fall back to a reoccurring income for the next 15 years example. So as we build more and more contract, all this reoccurring actually build up. So the next time when I get a similar size project, the percentage of contribution to the total group revenue actually it become less and less significant. That's why we are building a, a recurring income. When we when I did an MBO together with Sheldon, our recurring income is only 20%. And now it's creeping towards 85%. Having said that, uh doesn't mean that 85% is uh forever going up. It's depending on any particular year. If we sign in a major contract in the construction segment, which is a lump sum, so it might reduce the uh recurring percentage, but bear in mind the quantum should roughly to be the same or better. So when we complete the construction, if there's a reoccurring income after that, then you add on another layer of reoccurring income. That's why, that's how we build the recurring income to 85%. That's good. I think that's very sustainable and know you have your recurring income. Yeah. Okay, I think we have a question from CK. Can you share how you record the profit for your CMS segment? Is it fixed amount after issuing energy safe target or the more energy safe, the higher profit to KJTS? Yes, so uh, some people might have an impression that when we do energy saving, there's a shared savings. Means if I save this much, 50-50 or 60-40. So uh, that is a model that we can propose. But typically what we do is we actually fix a price that uh, the client will guarantee to save. So anything we can save more goes all towards our profit. So to answer the question, the more we save, the more we make. But the client are guaranteed a certain uh, savings amount or percentage. So uh, some might even ask, what if the T TMB or elasticity cost increase? So there's actually a fixed formula where we can increase our chill water or our energy cost, energy uh, cooling energy price when there's a increase in tariff because we cannot be uh, taking the risk, assuming the responsibility of uh, energy cost hike. So when they increase, there's a certain fixed formula we will pass through to our client. So in terms of savings, 
the client actually save more when there's an increase in TMB because the quantum actually increased, but the percentage will be the same. Of course, from the other end, which is our side, our profit margin remain the same in term percentage, but quantum will actually go up. Naturally, as the energy costs go up, all our existing contract, we tend to benefit uh, from the increase in energy cost. I would also but, like to... Oh, sorry, Casey. Carry on. Yeah, I think in the prospectus, they mentioned a risk factor where uh, if energy costs reduce, then our re our revenue and our profit quantum might be reduced. But uh, bear in mind, we in Malaysia are actually very blessed. In in Malaysia, it's actually uh, one of the lowest uh, in terms of energy cost in elasticity. So uh, the trend is globally is always an increase in energy cost. So we foresee there's a global trend of increasing energy cost. And Malaysia has been very lucky and been shielded by uh, our government. I would also like to add on to this when you talk about profit lines. If you look at our full energy management program that we provide under the CMS, uh, there are several lines of profit. One is, of course, when we when we get when we obtain such a model for fifteen or twenty years, uh, the first line of profits, of course, is the construction to so make one round there on the construction. Then, secondly, if we are asked to invest into the business, that's also a capex recovery process where we have a certain IRR that we we take back as profits as well. And then the third line of profits is that when we actually do the operation and maintenance, there is a fixed fee component in it that we also have a profit in there. And also there are speed off works that come out from managing the plant. So that's also another line of profits out there. So there's several lines of profit within the whole CMS. Uh, we want to state very clearly that all our pro propositions we, we, we initiate, it's always on the energy side, we will always push out this model. We'll never go down the path of looking at just construction. We'll always push this model out, initiate this way, have a conversation with the client, and then determine which way the client wants to go. And then we'll decide how we want to go about it, whether we're going to go through the EPCC way or we're going to go through the full model. Yeah. Can you share with us a bit of the plans? I think we noticed uh, uh, there are more data centers coming up. So I think it was a new thing that you are talking to some data centers. How are the prospects? Uh, we prefer not to comment until we can finalize. We are definitely looking, uh, talking to, we're always seeking opportunity like, and Data center is one of the highest, probably one of the highest consumer when it comes to cooling energy. Hey, interesting. Okay, we have some questions here asking. Okay, I think he's just following up, Mr. Ligan. Uh, currently, how many sites is contributing to the CMS? Shamila, I think it's in the prospectus, the uh, seven sites, I think. Correct, am I wrong, Shamila? Yeah, seven sites. Okay, yep, so seven sites, Mr. Lee. Okay. So I think we have a few questions from various uh, people. They're asking about, could you share a bit more of the competition and how stiff is the competition? Although I think you have some maybe a unique proposition like Sheldon saying the wrong kind of thing. So do you encounter uh, stiff competition in some of your projects or not? Yeah. And who are, who are they, if you could share? <laughs> then can no issue. I think uh, Sheldon mentioned, uh, if, you, if you look at the entire uh, value chain or chain of cooling segment. So uh, I repeat again, one is uh, consulting, the one like doing the audit and doing the design and engineering, the contractor who engineer uh, who do the do the construction of the plan. <clears throat> the third is the third segment is actually the operation, which usually in-house or they get a third party. And of course, there are so party who come up with the capex. So uh we believe that uh we, we are, have all the engineering and expertise to do all the three segments. So I think Sheldon mentioned about there won't be any finger pointing and anything goes wrong. And we actually put where the money where the mouth is. We can actually put the capex in the event that the client is not convinced. We can have a hybrid where they come out partial capex and we come out the rest, or we come out with 100. And we are most happy if the client can come out with the capex and hire us down. If I today I tell you you invest two million and you're going to get back your two million from energy or savings, savings energy in four years, we are welcome to sign us, tie us up for more than four years, let's say five years or six years. And if we do not meet the different the, the savings that we uh, said, we will top it up every time, every month. So they are assured the ROI that we, we have pitched in the beginning of the contract. This has always been our concept on guarantee. Otherwise, guarantee do not have any 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 value. So we actually put in a amount to top up. So this is something different from if uh, the staff mentioned about uh, I, my boss, I can do this. But again, if your staff do not achieve, what's your recourse? Are you going to terminate? Because capex already spent, but you don't get an ROI, it's too late. But engaging people like us as a third party, uh, third party to guarantee the savings, there's actually a real recourse 
to make sure that this uh the, this payback is achievable. So competition, you ask me, I'm not so worried more on outside competition as in a uh, competitor at construction company or even consultant. The, the biggest uh, challenge we have is actually the in-house staff itself to convince the owner that uh, we, we are professionally able to give them the assurance that whatever we pitch, we're going to deliver for sure. Hey, we have a question here from Jerry. Uh, he's asking about the long-term contracts of your clients. Uh, have you experienced any uh, early termination of contracts before? Yeah, as, as far as I recall, there's only one contract, which is a hotel in Joho. All the contracts we actually see through. In fact, I, mean, I mentioned earlier, some even renewed with us. So there's no early termination. Having said that, even less termination, whatever capex that we put in, there's actually a clause that uh, they have to uh, pay us back all the capex that we put in with a specific return. So if they choose to terminate, because we can't we can't tie, we can't dictate how the client do business. For that example, is let's say they sell the building or they sell the hotel. So uh, obviously we can't tell the owner, if you sign a contract with us, you can't sell the hotel. So there's always an exit clause. So they actually uh, terminate it earlier, but we are compensated when uh, they terminate the contract. And there's no, uh, in my, I don't recall, and I don't think there is, there's a termination that is because of the default by us and we are not being compensated. Hey, I think we have a question from William York. Uh, have you been involved in any data center projects previously and in what way were you involved? Uh, not in the actual big data center, but we are a subcontractor for one of the data center in Kuala Lumpur, one of the building here. Hey. Hey, Jerry, has a question asking about the Pahang f and outlets contract, uh, which is ending in December 23. Uh, could you have some update on that? Sheldon, I think uh, we got verbal confirmation. Yes, we got verbal confirmation to progress, to proceed, to carry on. Um, I believe there's also a question asking, are we planning to expand further? We, we've also obtained an approval of 1,000 workers for foreign workers for our cleaning division. So as of today, we've brought down, we've drawn down about 600 workers. We still got another balance of 400 workers that we'll be drawing down over the next couple of months. Um, and as far as the contract is concerned, yes, it's renewed. Hey, good news. Hey, it looks like we have answered most of all the questions that they have. Um, anything else, uh, Casey or Sheldon, you want to add before we call it night? It's been a long day, many presentations. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, I mean, uh, a lot of people have been very supportive, especially the fund. And thank you for the patience if I am able to uh, answer according to uh, the exact question, because sometimes I think uh, expectations are different. But uh, hopefully uh, at the 26th, uh, we will see you again. Hopefully uh, everybody can uh, be riding on the current market situation. I think you just mentioned, uh, Vincent, that uh, yes. you have just a few points from 2006, right? Yes. So hopefully the stars is alive for us as well. <laughs> 26 January, big yes. day. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Vincent, for moderating and thank you everyone that uh to uh, participating. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Himala. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye.